think we're I have to hit continue so i'm agreeing that it's going to be recorded hi welcome everybody welcome to our team usa training and tactics session with paralympian mallory wegeman my name is jody regan i am a volunteer with angel city sports and i am so happy to be um, the facilitator tonight um, this particular training is part of the 2021 angel city summer series presented by the hartford it's an honor to have Mallory with us tonight before she heads to Tokyo 30 days from now. Exciting. A couple of housekeeping, please. Um, please remain on mute for the duration of this session so everyone can hear Mallory. If you have questions or comments, please write them in the chat. I'm going to keep track and make sure all our questions are, are answered. We recommend when the session begins to go to the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen. It says the word view. And you want to click that to active speaker or speaker, or, yeah, active speaker or speaker view. And that way you'll see Mallory on the bigger screen. Um, another quick Zoom note for our adaptive athletes please make sure your Zoom name is accurate so we can give you 10 points for attending today's session. Remember, every virtual event you attend throughout the summer series will give you 10 points, and each 100 points unlocks Angel City swag and other cool prizes. And you can even get more points by sharing you are participating on social media and encouraging your friends and family to join you. We are fortunate to have medical volunteers supervising this session. If you are feeling sick or have an injury, please let them know. Finally, I'd like to take this moment to thank all of our incredible sponsors who made this event possible. First, a huge, huge thank you to the Hartford, the presenting sponsor of the 2021 Angel City Summer Series and the TFA group, along with our sports sponsors, the Hanger Clinic, Fox Sports, and Gold Meets Golden. And thanks of all of you for being here tonight, or today, depending on your time zone. Now I'd like to introduce Mallory, who will be heading to Tokyo for her third Paralympic Games. She is a two-time medalist with one gold and one bronze, at, oh, excuse me, and a 2011 ESPY winner. And last year even had time to publish a book entitled Limitless, the power of hope and resilience to overcome circumstances. And I could not put it down. Three days, took me three days to get through this, a little over 200 pages. And I just loved it, very easy read, very conversational, Mallory, just loved it, thank you. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, thank you, Mallory, for taking time out of your busy training and take it away. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jody. And for those of you who are joining, if you feel comfortable, I'm in gallery mode, so I would love to see your videos on so I can see all of your faces and, and have you guys join us. And also, I do have to introduce Sam, my dog, who very well will make an appearance or two because he's been at my hip all day, so you might see his little head pop in here a few times. Um, but I'm so excited to be joining you guys. I, I really appreciate the introduction, and as Jody said, I am about a month out for our, um, from my departure for Tokyo. Yesterday was the one month date before we leave. We will be boarding a plane on August 14th. And I am so excited to be able to represent Team USA at what will be my third Paralympic Games. I'm gonna be racing in six events. So as she stated in my bio, I am a proud gold and bronze medalist from the London 2012 Games. I competed in Rio and uh, due to kind of coming back from an injury in the years going in, I unfortunately did not make the podium, but had a remarkable games experience. And now am going in in six events with uh, three number one in the world rankings for these games. So I am super excited for all things that Tokyo is going to bring, but most of all, just the opportunity to be a part of these games. They have been very long awaited and I think it's gonna be a remarkable moment for our world to truly get to come together and unify after what has been a really hard past year and a half for so many of us. So also just wanna say a quick thank you to Angel City Sports. You guys are remarkable. For those of you that are joining athletes, I hope you are doing multiple of these virtual events because there's so many remarkable resources that they have at their fingertips just ready to, to offer up and hopefully bring you into the adaptive sports community even further. Um, so for swimming, first of all, how many, I'm looking at videos, how many of you guys are swimmers? If your video's on, raise your hand if you are a swimmer. 
See, this is where these videos on is really handy. All right. I love it. Okay. And if you're, how many of you are maybe not swimmers, but you're interested in swimming? Okay. So we've got maybe a little bit of a mix or you can, yes, you could type in the chat. That's also a great way to do it. Um, so I'll keep my chat open so you guys can engage while, while we're chatting and hanging out. Um, so for those of you that are swimmers, I would, before we kind of get started, instead of running through exercises tonight that we can do, by all means, feel free to do them if you want to. I thought it'd be good to give you maybe some tips of what it is that I do on land. So outside of the pool, what is my strength and conditioning and some of my dry land stuff look like that I do every day, every other day, kind of depending on the training cycle we're in. So one of the things for swimming that's super important is shoulder health. Um, shoulder health is probably, I think, the number one thing. Obviously for me, I am a wheelchair user. You can't really see my chair because I'm soothing so far back from the camera, but I'm a wheelchair user. So I use my shoulders for everything daily living, but also as an athlete. But prior to my paralysis, when I was a swimmer before my injury, shoulder health was a really big part of that as well. And so a lot of things that I do is really focusing on posture at all times in my daily life. I, I learned as an athlete and as a swimmer specifically in the pool, one of the biggest things that really can help your body alignment in the water is swimming with good posture. And so one way to mimic that as much as possible on land is constantly thinking about it, thinking about sitting tall, thinking about having your, your neck and chin in good alignment with your shoulders back. And so that's one super simple thing that you can be sitting at the dinner table, having dinner with your family, and just think about bringing your shoulders back versus sitting slouched forward. And those little things that you can do every day they add up and they really help your body in those movements when you're in the water. And so posture is a huge thing that I focus on. And to maintain that and think through that, depending on your impairment, um, core strength is a big piece of posture. And so for me as a spinal cord injury, I really focus on my core strength because that's a big space. That's a big part of aiding in that. And then that correlates into the water for me as well. And then when you start thinking of shoulder health, you know, I admittedly, I, I joke all the time, I don't do a lot of stretching as we kind of all think of stretching those stationary holds where you, you cross your arm across your body. I do more body movements. So it might be doing just some simple, even non-weighted, just, you know, doing internal rotations and thinking about where your, where your elbow is in relation to your side. I like to tuck a towel there because it holds my elbow in alignment with my shoulder. So I'm really just working on that shoulder rotation and then even external shoulder rotations. And so depending on if, you're, if your arms are a part of your impairment or not, for me, I do have a left arm impairment as well. In addition to my paralysis, um, you just got to play with that and figure out what works best for your body. But doing some of those little things are really important for making sure that when you go in the pool and you're swimming, you're keeping your arms healthy. Um, core work is also really important and that can, that can be different for all of you. Um, for me as a wheelchair user, one of the really simple things that I do is I really challenge myself to not use my backrest when I'm sitting. So if I'm on my computer or sitting at my desk, maybe doing some work or again, sitting at dinner, I'll just scoot forward in my wheelchair. So my back's not against my backrest. And even if just for a few minutes, work on sitting tall in my posture and keeping my core tight and, and bringing those motions into just really practical everyday activities in the long run makes a really big difference. Um, and we can talk more about different little kind of things that you can do when you're maybe not in the pool to help you in the water as well uh, when we open up for some Q&A later. But I just kind of wanted to give you guys some framework that for me with swimming, that that's a really big part of kind of where my mind goes is thinking through all those little things that you can do. And you're also catching me a month before I leave for Tokyo. And I feel like my job right now, I'll use the lemonade analogy. Just imagine you've made this amazing pitcher of lemonade with fresh lemons and you've been squeezing and squeezing those lemons, working to get everything out. And you have this great lemonade, but you got some lemon rinds left. 
and you want to just see if there's anything left in there. Right now I'm in the, is there anything left phase? I'm trying to get every last drop of lemon juice out of those lemons into my lemonade before I go to Tokyo. It's every last ounce of energy I have to become the best athlete I can be. So when I get behind those starting blocks in Tokyo, I know that I did everything I could to put myself in a position for success in that moment. So instead of me continuing to talk, we thought it would be fun to show you a video. The video is of my 50 meter freestyle gold medal race at the London 2012 games. And so Jody's going to play that for you guys. And then we'll chat a little bit more just about kind of some of the things that how training looks for me on a daily basis and, and kind of some of those intricacies, if you will, but mainly I want to open up for some questions. So you guys can ask questions and we can kind of dive into a conversation. Oh my God. I lost it. Are you kidding? Wait a minute. Hang on. Okay. One second. I had it all queued and it went to the next one. Let me just find it again. No worries. That's the uh, blessing and curse of everything on our computers, right? Yeah. Um, it's great when it's right at your fingertips and when it's not, it, it's, yeah. Okay. And guys, in the meantime, while we're, oh, you got it? Yeah, let me, I got okay. it. You just now I'm going to go back to share. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. That is qualifier. Madison Elliott will go in lane four for Australia. And those are the records. First swimmer for the Ukraine. Katarina Istamina. Goes in lane number one, posting 32-39 this morning. Mallory Riggerman goes in lane two for the USA, 32-01 to qualify. Sheng Nan Jiang goes in lane three for China, 31-81. Madison Elliott for Australia. Sorry. Goes in for the fastest qualifier with 31.57. Just outside the Paralympic record of 31.51. Jessica Long, the ever confident, self believing American, goes in five. Second fastest qualifier in 31.61. 20 years of age. Olesya Balakina. Balakina for Russia goes in six with 31.93 this morning. Here is Heather Fredrickson for Great Britain in lane seven, 32.34 to qualify. Heather Fredrickson, 26 years of age. A very powerful sprinter. And to complete the lineup, Morgan Bird goes in lane eight for Canada, 32.67. The 18-year-old qualifies in eighth place. And the competitors are now all out and all set to go in this final of the women's 50 meters freestyle S8. Came good in the last 15. Vladi Kinar leading all the way. Jiang was looking so good. A Paralympic record for Wegerman, of course. 31-13, well inside 31-5-1.
Second was to Elliott. Leaving it late, but a great silver medal, 31-4-4. There's the start. And the bronze going to Zhang. What a blanket finish. Perfect finish there. For Wegerman. Beautiful range and reach of stroke. No tension in the closing stages. Didn't tighten up for that Paralympic record. The results are official. Wegerman takes the gold. Elliot the silver. Zhang the bronze. Vladi Kinar miss. The colors can be sketched. Okay. <laughs> so fun. Guys, watching that video, I, I talk about it all the time where at the end when you see me finish, I look up at the Jumbotron and then I look back at the wall and I kind of shake my head and then I turn around and you see me ear to ear. And it was one of those moments where the only few moments of the race I remember is I remember the moments before the start. I remember at about halfway, I took my one and only breath and it was to my left hand side and I saw the feet of the woman in lane three. And I was like, oh boy, I gotta get going. And I buried my head and I went and when my hand met the wall, I saw the, there were lights on our starting blocks. And so I saw the one light above, turned around, looked, heard my name and kind of shook my head and looked up again. And then it finally all clicked. Um, I, I love that race so much for the obvious reason of it's the race that I won my Paralympic gold medal in. And there is nothing like sitting atop the Paralympic podium and hearing the national anthem play and seeing the American flag raise and seeing your teammates and your family and knowing that that moment, well, it's a huge personal success is about something also so much bigger than yourself. And it's about something so much larger than the race itself, to be honest. And so I, I always get goosebumps when I watch it and to just know the emotion of what that moment held. I was monitoring kind of the chats as, as we were watching. And, and one of the questions to help kind of give some context, one of the comments was, it seems that you race against different classifications. Is that always the case? And the answer is no. And the answer is that race, we were actually all the same classification. Um, and so I went into the London 2012 games classified as a seven for any of you that know about classification. That was my classification for four years. And three days before competition, I was pulled in for a review and I was moved up into the eight class just before the start of the London 2012 Paralympic games. And going into those games, I was ranked first in the world in six of the seven individual events and second in the world, but that the current world record holder in the second event. And so we had high prospects. We were planning that I'd be on both relays. We thought that it was going to bring nine gold medals. And well, that was not the case. The 50 meter freestyle came three days after opening ceremonies. So it was just a handful of days after my review was done. And what I'm most proud about in that race is knowing everything it signifies, symbolized. And, and knowing that, you know, it was really in so many ways, my journey coming, coming full circle. I was paralyzed in 2008 when I was 18 years old after complications from a medical procedure. And there I was four years later at the London 2012 Paralympic Games. And I think that in a lot of ways, sport allowed me to heal. It gave me purpose, it ignited passion, it gave me a, a place to, of a sense of belonging. It surrounded me with this remarkable community. And it, in a lot of ways, gave me something to fight for when I was in a really dark place in my life. And so when I ultimately won my gold medal in that 50 meter freestyle, you can imagine there was a lot of emotion. There was emotion of understanding everything I had gone through since my paralysis in 2008 while also understanding everything I'd gone through just in the past handful of days. I went into that race an underdog. I went into that race and frankly, I had gone into those games prospect for the potential of nine of nine gold medals. And by the day I showed up for the 50 meter freestyle, I had nothing more than a question mark next to my name. And I remember going into the ready room that night and I had my headphones on as you saw me wearing when I rolled out. And at the door, 
into the ready room, there were coaches from other countries because they had walked their athletes to the ready room and they were still standing there. And they stopped me and I pulled my headphones off and they wished me good luck as I went in. And my teammate came over before I put my headphones back on and he said, go shock the world. Those are the last words anybody spoke to me that night. I put my headphones back on. I listened to a song called All I Do Is Win on repeat. I just built my ego as high as it could go. And I sat in that ready room and I just literally like went tunnel vision into my little world. And when I got out onto the starting blocks, despite the noise that you heard through the video of the crowd, my little world went silent and it was just me. And it was that black line. And I could feel the force of my community at my back propelling me forward. And so that race to me is, is a reminder every day that when you want something and when you believe in something, you fight for every single inch and you don't let circumstance, you don't let doubters, you don't let last minute judgment calls, you don't let that derail you. I was in sixth place, depending on the angle you see of the camera, you could argue fifth, but then some ways you can argue sixth at the 25 meter mark in that race. The announcer says, boy, she left it late, but I was like, that's because I can't kick. It took me a while to build my speed. Um, but I fought for every inch of that pool. And I think that's so important for all of us, whether you're fighting for a gold medal, whether you're fighting for your Tuesday, whatever it is that you're fighting through in this moment, just remember that we all have doubters. We all have naysayers. We all have circumstances out of our control and we all have, we all have things that have the power to hold us back, but we also get a choice in it. And we get to choose if we show up and fight or if we step back and fold. And that's a choice we get to make. No one else gets to make it for us. And so obviously we are all passionate about swimming or we wouldn't be here. But I want to just leave you guys with that too, because that goes beyond the pool. And, and I think that's what I love about the sport so much is everything about swimming is about something so much bigger than swimming. And, and same with sport. And so... Um, just wanted to share that little bit about this, uh, about this race, but instead of just talking, I do want to go through, you guys have some awesome questions in here and I don't want to miss any. So I'm going to scroll up. We had the classification question. We had the wanting to know what song is playing when I came out, which I answered. Um, how do I keep my legs from sinking in the water when I swim freestyle? Okay. So if any of you on this call happen to have a spinal cord injury, this technicality will mean something to you. To everyone else, it may mean nothing. So bear with me for just a moment. I'm very fortunate in the fact for swimming, I'll say fortunate, it can have its challenges at times, but my legs are hyper flexible. I don't have spastic muscle tone in my legs with my spinal cord injury. And so with that, I'm able to do the start that I do because I'm able to get my joints to bend the way I need to, to tuck in that tight little ball which allows me to throw myself off, which allows them to unfold the way that I need them to unfold. Um, but regardless of that, even if your legs can't drag the way that mine do, there are little things that you can do in the water that really help. And this goes for anyone, whether you have the ability to kick or not. And, and it's don't forget your core. Whatever it is that you have of your core, do not neglect your core. And I say that because I have the perspective of, being a competitive swimmer for 11 years prior to my injury and now being back at it for 13 years post. And before my injury, I was all kick. And I probably neglected my core on every single turn I did, every single start and everything in between. And I just relied on the fact that my legs were powerful and strong and they could carry me. But I don't think I probably, knowing what I know now, ever actually maximized what they could do for me. And I say that because our core is so vital to how we ride the water in, in swimming, how our body position is, how we do our turns, how we activate when we're coming off the wall in a streamline. Everything we do in the pool stems from our core. And so now not having use of my legs and even now having the, the repercussions of my arm injury that I have where I have limited function mainly strength. I can move it just fine. It's just not as strong as the other arm. Um, 
I've, I've realized the importance of that. And so in freestyle, a lot of it's pressing your chest and utilizing that motion and paying attention to if your chin's tucked, your butt's going to drop. If your chin's up and you're kind of, you don't want to look too far forward, but you got a good alignment here. You're setting the rest of your body up for success in how it's, how it's aligned in the water. Um, butterfly pressing your chest and using that motion and not forgetting about it and swimming flat. All those little adjustments you can do can really manipulate where the rest of your body's at in the water and work to your advantage. So I tell people all the time with swimming, work with your body. Don't fight against it. Work with it because in the water, it can do remarkable things. And what works for me and what works for you might be two totally different things, but just play with it and see how that can, how those little minor adjustments can make a difference. We are going into my third games and I'm still making minor adjustments. So you're, you're constantly learning and pivoting and playing and adapting and figuring out ways to be better. And so play with that when you're in the water, even if it's just floating and you're not swimming, don't focus on speed, just focus on body movements. And that, that will really help you kind of find your center of gravity in the water and what works best for you. Um, as we move on, how often do I perform dry land versus in the pool? I swim five days a week. I used to swim six. I joke. This is like the one time I say I'm quote unquote old. I'm 32. I'm inching up there as an elite athlete. I by no means will say I'm old because I plan on going for at least two more games. Um, so, but with that, we have learned that my body responds better when I have two days of recovery versus one day of recovery. And so our mindset is to get out of that old train of thought of, you know, the more you do, the tougher you are, and the more you grind, the stronger you'll be, and really buy into the notion of smarter, not harder, and quality over quantity. And so I swim five days a week, and then I lift two days a week within that, and then I do body work, which is a lot of just preventative body treatment stuff we do for kind of prehab, whether it's doing laser therapy, ultrasound, um, different modalities to help with recovery in my body. We do that twice a week. So my week is still pretty full. Um, I feel like I'm constantly <laughs> training. And I always tell people too that, you know, it's interesting when you start to remove the mindset that the only training we do is when we're physically, if you're a swimmer, when we're physically swimming or physically lifting weights, you realize you're training a lot more. Um, everything I do is rooted around my training down to what am I drinking right now? When I talk to you guys, how am I rehydrating? How, what am I going to do when I get off this call to go into my recovery room and make sure that I'm doing those things so I can get back to training tomorrow and be recovered and ready for a new day. Um, and so those are, those are the little things, but there's the really big things. And at this stage, especially going into a games right now, they're probably the most, the most critical, um, of the process. You really want to think through like, what are you doing out of the pool or out of the field of play, whatever it is, the sport that you play might be that's setting you up to be the best you can be when you show up. And that's mentally, that's emotionally, and that's physically. And so not neglecting those other things and thinking it's just, I just got to get my laps in and come back tomorrow and do it again. There's a lot of in between there. Um, when we go down, okay, I'm just scrolling. We shared the link. Do you feel the current or waves created from the other athletes? And is there a technique to best combat that? Yes and no. Um, I say yes and no, because it depends on the pool you're in. Uh, at a games, traditionally the answer is no, because they're double lane lines. They've really focused on the width of the lanes and how the, how the water circulation is in the pool to, to minimize it as much as they can. Now you go to an older pool with high gutters and you swim in a lane against the wall, you better believe those waves are bouncing right off that wall and into you. Um, there's really no way to combat it. I would say the one thing, and this is just for racing in general, stick to the center of the lane. Center of the lane is always where you wanna be, especially when you're racing. If you're in long course meters and you're swimming 100, if you circle swim your race, when you do a turn, 
you just added a meter or two to your race because of the way in which you're circle swimming. Those are, those are really wide lanes in some of these pools. And so if you circle swim it, you're adding distance to yourself. Um, some people think that you can actually draft off of your competitors in the lane next to you. If you're actually behind them a little, you could hug the lane line and draft from their kick. My philosophy on that is I've never done it because when I race, my number one job is to focus on what I can control in my lane and only my lane. And I'm not to worry about what's going on around me. So I've never done the drafting thing, but again, you could ask 10 swimmers some of these same questions and they're going to give you 10 different answers. So this is kind of more my personal. Um, let's see. Are you in the same class for Tokyo? No. These are my first games being a seven. So I was reclassed finally in 2019 after seven years of being in that class. Um, and I'm getting to compete for the first time in the seven class. And I am so excited. I would say that what I accomplished in London, people ask me a lot of questions about what I went through with classification and depending on where in adaptive sports you are at, you know that it can be a really confusing, complicated process. But if you're new to the movement, I also encourage you to not get lost in that process because the Paralympic movement and adaptive sport is about something so much bigger than classification. And it can be challenging at times, but at the same time, why you love to do what you do shouldn't be rooted in the classification you're in. And so for me, I've taken a lot of pride in my career that I didn't choose to throw the towel in because I wasn't in the right class. I kept fighting because I loved to swim. And that's really what it came down to. And I showed up in Rio after an arm injury, thinking there was no way I was going to make it. And I swam in seven events. I made five finals and I finished that, that games with the fifth place finish in the 200 IM. And I knew I was still racing in the eight class, despite my new injury and everything I was up against. And it seemed unfair to be honest, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that what I did there is any less remarkable. It doesn't make me any less proud of what I accomplished. And so I would just encourage any of you who are potentially new in this to not get discouraged by that because the movement is about something so much more. And when you really love to do something, those things, while they can maybe make it a little more challenging, they shouldn't, they shouldn't determine if you're going to fight for it or not. So um, that I am very excited to be going in as a seven and get, get a shake at this because it's been pretty fun. Um, okay. Comments. Gosh, you guys are too sweet. Uh, how do you generate power getting out of the block during the start? Really good question. Um, it looks, I, so my comment always is the more graceful it looks, the more my back hurts. <laughs> I, I basically throw my back out when I do my starts. Uh, they're remarkable, they're fast, they're powerful, but I pretty much enter the water in a back spasm because I put so much force through my level of injury that it just, again, it's not the most pleasant feeling, but it's fast and your adrenaline's going, so you don't really pay attention to it in the race. Um, so I, I'm 5'9", so when we started doing my start this way uh, years ago, it was not that graceful. I, I kind of belly flopped a bit because I wasn't strong enough to get the upper part of my body far enough forward to allow my legs to stretch out behind me. So I wouldn't make it as far forward. I just kind of flop in. As I've gotten stronger over the years and clearly in London at a games, you're in peak performance, I am able to get enough strength through throwing and the motion of like basically like a lunge forward with everything I've got that functions to get my head and body far enough forward to allow my legs to kind of follow through. Um, it's, it's not easy. It was not pretty when I started doing it. I still have days transparently where at the point now in my career where I don't train starts at all because it's so tough on my body. We'll do a few starts as competition gets closer just to make sure I still got it. Um, but we don't train them. What we do do for starts though, is we train reaction time. And there's a lot of ways you can train reaction time without actually having to do the movement. 
And so it's different stuff that my strength and conditioning coach and I do on land to work on our reaction time, to work on reaction time when there's other distractions around us, to throw different things at it, to tell me that my job is to, to react in whatever task he's having me do when he says orange, but he's going to throw 10 colors at me first in random orders before he says orange to make sure I don't react to the wrong thing. Um, so we do a lot of it basically more like the neuro side of it. And, and I love that. And it takes the strain off of my body having to constantly repetitively do that motion while making sure I stay sharp so I can get that quick reaction time off the blocks. Um, so that's my start. A weakness you have managed to improve both physically and mentally on your training and your race performance. Wow. So many things could be said there. Um, I think that the biggest thing, in my opinion, as an athlete, that we neglect and can by neglecting become our weakness is the mental side of sport. We, we wrap so much up into this physical endeavor that we forget that what's going on between our ears is, I would argue once you, especially once you get to a games and you get to that like echelon of competition, it's more important than what your body can do. Um, I think that your, your mind shuts down faster than your body ever will. Meaning our mind blocks us when our body still has more to give. And so that is something I've worked on a lot throughout my career of making sure I'm getting the most out of my body by not letting my brain mentally block me. And so sometimes that's creating an intimate relationship with pain. Um, that's, that's realizing that in this moment, in this workout where I'm doing five 100s on rest 10, right into 200s, and I, we're just cranking through a high, high intensity and endurance set, um, our brain's going to want to say, I can't. Our body is going to get tired and our brain's going to want to come and say, no. And so in those moments, how do we stop that language and think about what it is, the narrative we're telling ourselves and say, I got this. I can do this. I can do it all day long. If you're coach or say that again. No, I wasn't going to, no, no, we're, we're getting close to the end. So I just wanted to, Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. I didn't, I didn't, I thought you were at stopping at a sentence. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, okay. you probably think you're heads up. I'm on full screen. So I don't have my clock. So thank you, Jody. No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so mental is super important. I think for me, that's been one of the biggest things is learning how to train through physical, um, one of my biggest weaknesses is my turns, getting off the wall and getting tempo back up. And so just finding ways, I mean, it's repetition, guys. You can't race, you can't race it if you don't train it. So what you do every day when you're training, it's gonna be how you race. If you breathe going into every finish, guess what you're gonna do in a race? You're gonna breathe before every finish. And so just being mindful of that, I think is really, really important. Um, what's your favorite experience or funniest memory from a Paralympics outside of the pool and competition? Mallory, I'm so sorry, but we, we've run out of time. No worries. Can I end on that one really fast, Jody? Yes, and go ahead. Give, go ahead. We're given a good end on the Paralympics. Um, my favorite memory, I think the biggest tradition I love outside of it is we pin trade. And so it's such a remarkable way to meet athletes from all over the world. And there's that moment where you just realize like you are so small in this bigger thing that is a Paralympic Games. And that makes it so humbling and so exciting. And being able to meet people from every corner of the world and understand that you relate on such an intimate way through your passion for sport, through your craft as an athlete, through the journey and sacrifices you've done, I think is remarkable because sometimes the, the journey can feel lonely when you're making these big sacrifices to chase that dream and coming together and trading pins and being in the dining hall and seeing the world literally come together is probably one of the coolest things out of games, hands down. Thank you so much, Mallory. There was, there was one question in the chat about why they kept changing you your class like classification i encourage everyone to purchase or get out of the library mallory's book because she addresses that in her book 
So there, there's the hook. There's the plug for your book. <laughs> Thanks, Jody, And thank you guys for being here. This was great. And always feel free to reach out on social media if you have questions. Well, thanks to everyone who joined us in this workout and our medical volunteers. And a big thank you again to Mallory Wegeman, the TFA group, Fox Sports, the Hanger Clinic, Gold Meets Golden, and of course, the Hartford. Uh, be sure to follow Mallory on social media at Mallory Wegeman. Maybe Camille or Josh can type that into the chat. Also, she's got a website and it's MalloryWegemanUSA.com. So if you guys want to type that, that'd be great. Um, we hope to see all of you at our 5K training boost, which will begin tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And then on Saturday um, at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to be playing Survey Says, which will be an Olympic and Paralympic themed version of Family Feud. Virtual. We're going to do it. Um, please join us and stay updated with everything we have going on via email and social media. Thanks to everyone and have a great evening. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> Thank you, Mallory. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Good Mallory, luck I'm from everybody at ACS. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to try the techniques in my pool. So oh. I'm, I was. I love I love learning how to. Of course, seven strokes, and I'm at the end of my pool, so it doesn't. You know. You but. need to uh, tie a. They make like the resistance belts, and you just anchor them to like if you have a diving board or you have something heavy on land, you can anchor it, and they just swim in place. Oh, good point. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I trained during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Mallory. We really appreciate it. We're rooting for you. Let's get a uh, bring bring home some more hardware. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And I hope the rest of the events go well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.